The universe is governed by the laws of physics, and gravity is one of the most fundamental. But what happens when modern technology dares to test these forces? And what happens when the human body becomes the victim of our relentless quest to go faster than ever before? In this video, I'll tell you how a secret military project led to faster planes, safer cars, and even helped us walk on the surface of the moon. Then you'll see how the fastest man on earth shook the US military with his gruesome brush with death and how he lived to tell the tale. But before we begin, we need to talk about G-Force. G-Force measures acceleration and deceleration, how much we speed up and slow down. One G is the force it takes to keep your feet stuck on the ground, and each extra G multiplies that feeling of weight. So if you experienced 5 G, that would produce the feeling of being crushed by five times your body weight. If you experienced 10 G, that would be the equivalent of being sat on by a manatee, eating a bucket of pressed ham. And that's a lot. Accelerating to 100 miles per hour in a sports car only hits around 1.2 G, and Formula One drivers get up to 4.5 Gs. G-force is dangerous, and the human body didn't evolve to withstand it. Exactly how dangerous depends on a range of factors. Physical fitness, the duration and direction of movement, even posture. If you combine G-force with vibration, even very low G-forces can kill or seriously injure you because of the damage it causes to internal organs. But if G-force is so dangerous, how did Colonel John Stapp of the US Air Force survive 46 Gs? Before I get to his incredible story, let's talk about what happens when the human body experiences extreme G-force. Imagine you're in the space shuttle, about to blast off on a voyage to discover new worlds. You're sat on top of 383,000 liters of liquid hydrogen fuel. You blast off and the rockets explode beneath you, pushing you into the sky. As the G-forces build, you're pinned back into your seat and the cockpit rattles and shakes. As the G-forces increase, the blood drains away from your brain and pools in your feet and hands. This causes cerebral hypoxia. As your brain stops getting the oxygen it needs, you feel euphoric but the G-forces keep building and you quickly start slipping away. The sensitive capillaries in your eyeballs are the first to be affected. The color drains from your vision and everything goes gray. In a matter of seconds, tunnel vision sets in and then total blackout. You go blind and moments later fall into a state called gravitationally induced loss of consciousness, also known as G-lock. If you don't regain consciousness soon, death follows very quickly. This is exactly what happens on the euthanasia coaster, a roller coaster deliberately designed to kill its passengers with intense g-forces. Designed by artist Julio Jonas Urbonus, this hypothetical ride is the ultimate roller coaster. So extreme, it sends out 24 people and they all come back dead. Its purpose is to kill humanely either for suicide or execution, and its designer claims it could take lives with elegance and euphoria. Passengers would climb up a steep incline, make a final yes or no decision at the top, and then plummet 500 meters. Accelerating up to terminal velocity would subject them to 10 Gs. If the roller coaster stopped there, the passengers would probably survive because the body can withstand high G-forces for a brief period, but the coaster keeps going pushing the body through seven smaller and smaller loops, each designed to keep the body at 10 Gs for a full minute. Passengers' brains would be starved of oxygen. They would pass out and simply never wake up. The roller coaster would stop, the corpse is unloaded, and fresh riders strapped in. For now, the euthanasia coaster is just an art project, a conceptual piece designed to ask questions of what the future might hold when life expectancies keep getting longer. But this white knuckle death ride shows that 10 Gs could be guaranteed to kill. So how did Colonel John Stab survive 46 of them? To answer that question, we must go back to the late 1940s, to a top secret military testing facility in the deserts of New Mexico. It's the start of the Cold War, and the contest for global power between the USA and USSR is beginning to heat up. Both sides are frantically racing to develop better, faster aircraft that might just give them the edge if World War III broke out. As well as the threat of war, both superpowers were hungry for the biggest scientific prize there was, putting a man on the moon. That dream was still some way off, 
but both countries knew that the first to succeed would prove themselves to a world still choosing between two very different visions of the future. Enter John Stapp, a career United States Air Force officer, surgeon, physician, and biophysicist. Stapp was a military man and scientist who dreamt of building safer planes and contributing to the USA's budding new space industry. While a surgeon in the Air Force Medical Corps during World War II, Stapp witnessed the horrific effects of countless plane crashes and became convinced there was a pattern to how some men died and how some survived. He set himself the goal of finding out what this pattern was and how he could use it to eliminate unnecessary death wherever he found it. Even before beginning work on the G-Force program that would make him famous, Stab volunteered to take part in dangerous experiments, one of which was to find out what would happen if an aircraft's canopy was blown out in flight. To do so, Stab flew a fighter jet with no protective glass in the cockpit blasting his face with winds up to 570 miles per hour. The test was a success and Stapp returned to base sore, but in one piece. But Stapp's greatest and most dangerous work was yet to come. In 1947, the US Air Force asked Stapp to begin a top secret study into the effects of G-Force on the body. They hoped the new information would help them improve the survival rate of US pilots and give them a crucial advantage over the Russians. These experiments started slowly, but quickly grew, becoming more and more dangerous. To simulate the effects of a plane crash, the US Air Force began strapping volunteers onto rocket sleds and firing them along a strip of track in the desert before suddenly slamming on the brakes. These high-speed deceleration tests could simulate the effects of crashing into a brick wall at speeds well over 500 miles per hour. Remember, this was a time before crash test dummies, and these kinds of tests relied on brave volunteers who were often seriously injured, sometimes even killed. As a hands-on scientist, Stapp always insisted on volunteering for test runs himself, and very soon, his research began to yield useful data. He discovered new ways of improving seat design and harnesses, and how the seating position of the pilot could affect the chances of survival in an emergency. But Stapp wasn't satisfied and was determined to push his experiments to the very limits of human tolerance. Stapp's commanding officer begged him to stop, as the risk of death climbed higher and higher. But Stapp continued in secret, increasing the speed of his test runs from 90 miles per hour to 150, then 200, then 300, and then higher still. Even in the early tests, he suffered broken ribs, broken wrists, and lost all his fillings. But still, this wasn't enough for Stapp. He knew modern fighter jets flew much faster, and he wanted to know what would happen to the body at even higher impact speeds. Soon, Stapp was reaching over 400 miles per hour on his new rocket sled, Sonic Wind No. 1. On December 10, 1954, Stapp climbed aboard his giant firework for what would be his final test run. This experiment was designed to simulate being ejected from a supersonic fighter jet an incredibly dangerous feat that had never been attempted before. Wearing a special crash helmet, Stapp was tied into his seat. His hands were bound and he stared at the track that stretched out before him into the dry heat of the New Mexico desert. The countdown began and Stapp made a silent prayer. The rockets below him roared into life, punching Stapp along the track at ever increasing speeds. The acceleration crushed him back into his seat with a force that could break bones and bend iron. Despite his new harness, the G-Force sucked the blood from his brain and he began to black out. For those few seconds, Stapp earned the title of the fastest man on earth, breaking ground speed records with an incredible 632 miles per hour. As he roared along the track, he experienced wind blast equivalent to pilots bailing out of a fighter jet at 1,000 miles per hour. But Stapp's experiment wasn't over, and the worst was still to come. As Sonic Wind 1 reached the end of the track, the new liquid braking system kicked in, sending a huge plume of water erupting from the back of his sled. As the brakes locked up, Stab jolted forward, his body straining against his harness. His lungs collapsed and his eyes bulged. His inside squashing like a tomato kicked against the side of a shed. Colonel Stab had gone from near the speed of sound to a dead stop in a fraction of a second. Decelerating at that speed had never been done before, and witnesses looked on in horror. It was the equivalent of ejecting at Mach 1.6 at 40,000 feet. 
a shock more brutal than crashing into a brick wall at 120 miles per hour. The only difference between this and a high-speed car crash is this lasted nine times longer. In that moment, Stapp's body endured a peak of 46 Gs, an insane amount of force, many times more than a lethal dose. And it had burst nearly every blood vessel in Stapp's eyeballs. The medics rushed over and unstrapped the now limp Air Force Colonel from his rocket. Somehow, he had survived, but his eyes were two rolling black discs of blood. His skin, too, was covered in strange blisters. I can't see, he mumbled to the medics. Miraculously, although his eyes had burst, his retinas had not been detached. So slowly, the blood drained away and his sight returned. Medics couldn't find any major injury and soon gave him the all clear. His commanding officer was also pleased to find him sat upright in his hospital bed only a day later, enjoying his lunch. Despite the horrific ordeal Stapp put his body through, his survival proved his theory about G-Force. With the right harnesses and preparation, it's possible for the body to withstand the terrible effects of high-speed acceleration and deceleration. Because what kills you in a car or plane crash isn't the G-Force, but the mangling effects of the impact. Stapp's survival proved that ejector seats were a viable technology, and his research solved many of the most pressing problems faced by the aerospace industry. Even after his time in the U.S. Air Force, Stapp continued his work in a civilian role, designing safer cars that crumple in the right places and seats to reduce whiplash. His work also led to airbags and smarter crash test dummies, allowing mankind to travel faster and crash harder without dying. Colonel John Stapp was honored as a hero, and the technologies he worked on have saved countless lives. The Air Force Chief of Staff called him one of the bravest men in the world and awarded him several medals for his pioneering contributions to the USA's successful development of high-speed travel. So, do you care enough about your country and science to strap yourself to a rocket and burst your eyeballs? And was John Stapp a hero or a lunatic? Let me know what you think in the comments section down below and thanks for watching.